Hi, welcome to the Bipolar Awakenings podcast with me, Sean Blackwell. And today I'm going to be talking to Jen McDonald. Jen entered into extreme states of consciousness while backpacking in India in 1998. Because she had a loose understanding and framework for these experiences, she recognized that they were spiritual and not necessarily signs of psychosis. Jen came across my book, Am I Bipolar or Waking Up, about 10 years ago, and it validated many of her experiences. She even organized an event for me while I was back in Toronto a few years ago. For the past 24 years, Jen has been involved in several online groups that seek to validate, support, and even celebrate experiences similar to the ones we've had. Currently, she's working on a book that she hopes to reassure people in psycho-spiritual crisis that they're not crazy and they're not alone. I wanted to interview Jen because I thought she'd be a great person to go in depth with around the topic of spiritual experiences. Okay, so Jen, thanks for coming. Thank you, Sean. Thanks so much for having me. I really appreciate this opportunity. And I'm very grateful for everything that you've done over the past many, many years. Uh, The people that I've talked to in the community, pretty much all of them have cited your work as something that has had a huge impact on them. It's really helped them to navigate what they've been going through. It's really been reassuring for them. And it's provided them with a sense of empathy for their situation. Yeah, thanks. I appreciate it. I've uh, been getting a lot of that lately, especially on these podcasts. It's been pretty cool to hear. And so anyways, uh, how did things start for you? You, you? We started by talking about this experience you had in India. If you could go into you know, a bit of a summary of what happened to you there. Yeah, sure, sure. Um, I had gone to India. This is my second time going to India. This was back in 98. And I had gone there with a specific intent to explore spiritual spirituality and the Indian ways of uh, conceiving about the cosmos and reality. I was very, very curious about all these things. So it was one of those um, get more than what you ask for situations. <laughs> because, yeah. I've heard that before. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. This comes up a lot. Um, So yeah, I was in Rajasthan and I wasn't meditating. I wasn't taking any drugs. I was just walking down the street one day and I felt this very perceptible like crack in my consciousness. All of a sudden I shifted into another way of experiencing things. And it was, it didn't, I I thought, oh, this is weird. This is strange, but things didn't really escalate um, for a couple of weeks. So I still continue to travel in India. And then I, it seemed to me that my consciousness was expanding. And the best way I can describe it is that it was expanding and embracing all things. So the ego gen that I was familiar with was starting to dissolve. And I was starting to become the cosmos, like the universe, everything. So at that point, I was in India and I thought, okay, I better get back to my mom's in Mississauga, Canada, because this seems like a, could be possibly a very serious situation. And so the process of buying a ticket to get back to Canada was quite interesting and challenging because I was in these altered states and I had started to see synchronicities everywhere. I had started to lose my sense of Jen as a individual I. Um, I remember I was in a train station in Omnibad and I walked into the train station and there was something about the structure of the train station that really resonated with me. And I started recalling these dreams that I had had many, uh, maybe even a year before that, about a train station and a structure collapsing. Oh, like my self schema, my self, uh, what I think makes up myself is collapsing. So I was very, yeah, I was very happy, first of all, to get those little hints from dream that had happened in the past and then to be (laughs) getting out of India. So that's a very, very intense spiritual place. It's very hard to open up completely when you're there and have no grounding. So, yeah, so my ticket... Uh, I passed through Thailand on the way back to Canada and Thailand was a much more calmer place. And I thought, oh, you know, maybe I won't have to go back to Canada. Maybe this is okay. 
things are okay. But I had started to feel like I had been sort of transported into another world, um, very different from the one that I had acknowledged as real and firm, firmly um, unchangeable. And I felt like I was being, Dor I was Dorsey in The Wizard of Oz and I was suddenly, <laughs> yeah, into another whole other land that I didn't quite understand. Along with that, um, I started to, and this is very common, um, I think we both have uh, come across people who express this, this sort of dream, am I dreaming? Am I dead? Am I going crazy? Mm -hmm. Like I'm trying mm -hmm. to figure out what's going on. It seemed like I was in this kind of Bardo state. I remember at one point I met this guy, this American guy, and we were sort of exploring Bangkok and we had I was in these states and the synchronicities happening and we went on a ferry, we crossed over the river and I was just like resonating with this sort of mythological um, symbolism of this crossing over. And so that was like my, uh, one of my last days in Thailand or in Asia. And I just like got back to Mississauga. I said to my mom, something's going on with me. It's okay. I'll be all right. I just need some time. And because I had um, read Stan Groff's book, uh, Stormy Search for the Self and Spiritual Emergency, many, many years before that, I knew, okay, this is a spiritual and psychological experience that I've got myself in way over my head, but this does not feel like psychosis. And from what I understand, it's not psychosis. So I sort of endured what I was going through, but it was very, very, very difficult. I was way beyond the paradigms that I was familiar with. I was experiencing mystical unity. I merged in with everything. And because I was in this sort of uh, beyond typical state and I was merged in with everything and identifying as one with the one, I started to think, huh, I think I might be the second coming. Yeah, that makes sense. So I really felt like this is what Jesus was like. Yeah, okay, I, I get it, Jesus. And I, I really identified with, uh, with being some sort of savior type thing, person. And from what I understand, that's also very, very common. Like it's, you enter into these states of consciousness and that's a logical, at that point, conclusion to draw. However, uh, it's also not, maybe not the best thing to go around telling people. And I really had to keep, like seriously, I had to keep my lips sealed because I felt like I had this big message to deliver to everyone. <laughs> but I also felt like, Hmm, I'm going to draw a lot of attention to myself. If I start saying these things, it's going to be hard for people not to feel so concerned that they would send me to a psychiatrist. Um, oh, and a, yeah. Right. Okay. Yeah. Another couple of things at this point, I was very, very raw. I was open to everything and all of my previous pains throughout my life just came right up to the surface. So I'm merged in with everything. I'm worried that, huh, I think I have a message. I think I've got to save everything. And I'm in excruciating pain. But at the same time, I apprehended that the only way out of this was through it. There was no aborting what was going on. And I also felt like I was being guided at certain points and there was benevolent forces supporting me. So although I feared that something I might not be able to get back from where I was. I also felt like I was supported in where I was. And the last couple of things I want to bring up that really um, sort of distinguished this time of my life and also that from talking to people over the past 24 years seem very, very common and very pathologized. Are this, um, is this opening up? People say, it seemed like I was seeing more and the way or what I was experiencing seemed realer than real, which I find very interesting. Um, I think it was even Chris Cole that said he felt like he had tapped into something greater and that most people just weren't aware of. 
So that was occurring as well. And I just remained very open and curious and I am still very curious. Um, I did end up going into the psych system at one point because I had been living in these states and just sort of managing. I was really just managing, you know, um, and I was working with high need students, uh, very, um, very challenged kids, you know, people with um, uh, autism and fetal alcohol syndrome. So they're very, very difficult to work with. And after 10 years of being in these altered states, I started to really, really burn out. You know, like I just, I, I noticed like I was putting my keys in the fridge. I was crying, like just bursting out in tears. So I, um, I went to the psych, the psych ward because I knew, or psych, uh, in Emerge, I went to Emerge and I said I need to be admitted into a psych, um, department just for rest. Yeah. But I knew that that wasn't really gonna, gonna be enough to get me a bed. So they said, you know, do you think you're going to hurt someone? And I said, yes, I did. No, I didn't at all. And I never have, but if you need to get a bed, if you need to be somewhere where you're not crying all the time and you're not burning yourself out after having lived in these states, that's the way to do it. So I was given, uh, in the psych hospital, a diagnosis of schizophrenia, which they based on the fact that I had said that I merged in with everything and everything was one. Um, so I just, you know, I had, I, I was describing my spiritual experiences to them and they had no framework for it no understanding of it. But what was, um, more of a shame, you know, really, I uh, really disheartening was I was explaining to them the purposeful processes that were going on, the value to what I was experiencing. Yes, I needed a rest. Yes, I was very overworked and this, the condition that I was in was very challenging, but I was explaining to them these processes that were, um, had they had all the material that was brought up from my unconscious. It was like it was being witnessed by me and reassimilated for my increased well-being and they had no place for that they they just were looking i felt like they were looking to pathologize things that i was expressing that they they didn't have an understanding of and it really uh i really feel um uh, pained by this, you know, the situation of being marginalized and invalidated, not having purposeful, purposeful experiences recognized and supported, which is why I've been involved in these, these groups for so long, which why, which is why I want to write a book about these things to depathologize and um, to demystify them and to offer people support in what could potentially be a beneficial experience. Yeah, well, it's really needed. There's no doubt about that. The more hands on deck we can get, the better. So um, let's just go back a little bit. First, when did you eventually get yourself hospitalized? Yeah, it was 10 years after it started. So 98, 2000. Years. Yeah, yeah, 2008. Yeah. Okay. Okay. And then I'm curious, going right back to the beginning, because we were going to sort of unpack a lot of the kind of experiences that you had in India. That was kind of the intention of the interview, right? Yeah. So yeah. just going back, one thing I ask when people uh, come to me for a consultation is what do they think might have triggered this initial episode? Obviously it was going to India, but could you get into some specifics about what do you think created this opening? Because you weren't doing drugs, you weren't, you weren't smoking marijuana, you weren't meditating. So you're just walking along on the street and then boom, <laughs> this thing happens, right? Yeah. Um, or yeah. the beginning of it. So what, what, what do you think was going on that was sort of unlocking you to a certain degree? Yeah. Yeah. The precursor I would say is the, when I had gone to India in, I think it was 95, let's say, um, the first time that I'd gone there, I, for the first time realized that I'm not the ego. I have an ego, but I'm not the ego. There's something else, like there's something more vast, like a true self, uh, an awareness 
And the other thing I realized when I was there. Hang on. So this was yeah. like a this was like a intellectual sort of grasping that you're mm. not your ego that you were no. going through. Yeah, right, right, right. It was an awareness. Like all of a sudden, like I just became aware. Oh, the thoughts about I am this, I am that, I am that. Those are just thoughts, and there's like a deeper essence to myself that's truer. So it allowed me to let go of some of the baggage around this, this ideas of Jen, you know, I think I was like 20, I want to say 25 at the time. So, mm -hmm. you know, I'd come from the, uh, childhood, not, I had a, a fine childhood, but there was still, you know, adverse experiences. And there was definitely a feeling of not knowing, um, who I was. Yeah. I think this is a big thing. People in India walking around with their backpacks on, like, who am I? What is all this? Yeah. So that was, so you were there sort of to find yourself. You were kind yeah, of, yeah, to yeah, find yourself. yeah, okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and the questions about like, what is reality? Why are the, why is the Indian culture experiencing it much differently? So when I returned in 98, I was super focused on exploring these things. Yeah. But I hadn't really even started. Like I had just arrived, and that's right. when so I was it was your it was your second trip. Yeah, it was my second trip with a with a very strong intention to explore the what am I, what is reality. So in that first trip, nothing happened to you particularly shocking. No, not particularly. I mean, there okay. was, but there wasn't not to the extreme at all. Okay, and how how many years apart were the trips? I'm going to say three. Three years apart? Yeah, three or four. Were you a hippie at heart? <laughs> no, I don't think so. Or at least before, you know, before I went to India the first time, I'd never really heard of spirituality. And I grew up in the suburbs. We didn't, like, explore spirituality. So it was, like, the, the opening to, like, the spiritual and who am I? Yeah, that that really, not a hippie, but very interested in these things but you you had to have this interest in spirituality before you went to india the first time it wasn't like you decided to go yeah. to india and then found it you <laughs> no i am um, i i was living in oxford england yeah at the time mm. backpacking and i had a bad well a break a 20 something breakup and uh i was devastated like just the bottom of my world had fallen out so i hadn't heard about spirituality but these Friends of mine in England have heard about spirituality and they'd all been to India. They're like, we know what to do. Get yourself over to India. That'll cure your heartache. And so wow. that's what, yeah, that's what segued into the, into the. So uh, your first trip to India was kind of to get over a breakup. Oh yeah, it was. And you were just taking, you, you were just taking the advice of some friends of yours in England. To, to <laughs> yeah. Cover. You went off to India and that sort of was the first step that sort of showed you a new door. And then you decided to go back three years later and the, blew the door wide open. Exactly. Something like that. Okay. Wow. And you said that you had already read some of Stan Groff's work. Um, yes. That was in the... The, in between the India trips, I had gone to this place called the Transpersonal Institute in Toronto. And I think I know that place. Yeah, yeah. It was on, I can't remember what it was, but yeah, so I'd gone there. And that was one of the books that I took. In, in a, I'd gone there just for workshops and courses. And that was one of the books they had with Sam Groff's uh, The Stormy Search for the Self, I think it was. And uh, I think this wow. Is so cool. that book, that's book, on, that book, Stormy Search for Self, on the subject of spiritual emergency. Yeah, you read before you had this opening. I was very so, lucky. So, so you were really um, educated on what could happen, which is, which is quite a surprise because most people, when they read that book, like I did read it after they've had their crisis. They, they express their crisis and then a therapist says, well, you should really read this book, you know? And then they read the book to, to solve what was going on with them. But you had the sort of the playbook even before you had the crisis. Yeah, uh, I was so lucky because I had that reassurance. I had that validation. 
I had, you know, a little bit of framework for it. And uh, during when I was going through what I was going through, I, you know, searched my mind was desperately trying to figure out what is going on. And so I had Groff's book and I also started to look at Young because I felt like, okay, I think that red book might also be the same terrain. Like we might be, have experienced the same terrain. Right. And to give a little backstory for people, the, the red book was basically um, a therapeutic process that Carl Jung put himself through when he recognized that he was going through something similar to what was being labeled as schizophrenia. And he had, um, he was in conversation with a couple of entities in his head, pretty much. Uh, one in particular I can remember, but I think there might've been a few others. And he would write all this stuff down, but he was also doing amazing artwork during this time to work through his process. Mm -hmm. And his family kept this book under lock and key, I think in a safety deposit box uh, and would not release it to the public because they thought it would destroy his career. And they only released it when they thought that the, the culture was ready to accept what he was talking about at, I think he died in 1962. So they sort of locked the book up in 1962 and then they, they printed it out around 2009 or something. And I'll, I'll, I'll be honest, my perspective is that the text is pretty personal. It's, it's not an easy text to read because you're not really sure what he's talking about a lot of the time, but the artwork is spectacular and completely original. You know, uh, he, he was a really gifted artist and he'll probably not be recognized for that, you know, but amazing book. Yeah. 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 So going back to your story. Okay. So you just, you have this sort of death of the ego experience and, but you were completely better prepared than any person I've ever met <laughs> for having this kind of thing. Cause you've read the stormy search for itself. You've been to India the previous years or three years earlier. Um, and so what was the first sort of spiritual experience that hit you? Um, I'd have to say, I, I guess, well, realizing that I was one with everything. It was a very welcome experience to, to realize that I'm not disconnected, you know, I'm not like, um, yeah, I'm not disconnected from the world. I'm actually one with the world. However, merging in and losing my ego identity completely was a little more extreme. Um, other spiritual experiences. Well, well, let's uh, let's yeah. talk about that for a second. Okay, okay, so yeah. How did that impact your behavior when you were in India? Like, did other people notice you were going through something? Or were you acting st sort of weird and people's eyes were rolling? <laughs> no, it was very easy to hide actually all this stuff. You know, I continued to hide it for 17 years. I, I, I continued to hide these things. Um, but I will say mm. about, uh, how did it affect my behavior? Okay. So inwardly though, so when I was having this mystic union, I began to experience the world as a fantastic battlefield of the forces of good and evil. And I saw myself mm -hmm. at the center of these events and having a great, had a role to play. I was supposed to maintain the cosmic balance. So my behavior changed in that I was very focused on these inner experiences. Um, so people in India who wouldn't you know recognize that my behavior had changed at all. And when I was okay. home, I was just very, very quiet and inwardly battling the forces of good and evil. Inwardly. So it wasn't really impacting your um, external behavior? No. I mean, this was all playing out on, I'm going to use this term very, very loosely, another dimension. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because I don't okay. really know, I don't really know how I even conceive of, of this yet, to tell you the truth. But, okay. um, yeah, it seemed to be playing out on other levels. And so I would, I would go to the store and I would be mm -hmm. on an epic odyssey. I would feel like, like the store, the guy would say something like, oh, those, 
those chocolate bars are good. And I'd be like, ah, those are the ones to have because this is going to maintain the goodness in the universe. Like everything was permeated with meaning. Yeah. Okay. So it was all like infused in my normal behavior, but inwardly I'm making choices, which I think are going to impact the future of mankind. It's very stressful. Whoa. So <laughs> yeah. whether you're picking the right chocolate bars in, in, the, in the store Everything. has this massive spiritual implication. Wow. Yeah. Pretty sure chocolate bars are evil though. <laughs> Don't tell me that. <laughs> I can't go back and undo that. <laughs> yeah, seriously, there, it's very challenging to live in that kind made a, of mind, a made mindset. Made a bad decision that time, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But again, you know, it's there's something going on that's um, that it's not uh, not easy to kind of label as one thing or another. Okay. And so this thing about going, like balancing the universe and cosmic consciousness, um, good versus evil was continually for 17 years. That was lessened. It just sort of ebbed away, decreased. Yeah. Um, okay. Over maybe. Fade, huh? Yeah. It started to fade over maybe say seven, eight years, maybe nine years. And what actually, what had led me to go into the, the psych ward was I recognized this later after reading Catherine Lucas's book, um, in case, uh, case of spiritual emergency, I think it is. Um, in case of spiritual emergency. Yeah. 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 It. Yeah. So after I got into the psych hospital, I had, I ordered her book and I read the part that she writes about the return. It's like the return. That's it. So I had departed you know, everything that I'd known, I got mm -hmm. myself into this very challenging place, like state of consciousness. And I don't know what was happening, activation of the psyche. And I was working with these kids, you know, I was just pushing myself. And that's when I you know, started crying all the time and I realized, okay, I need, I need a break. And then when I was reading Catherine Lucas's book. I thought, oh, I needed to return. Like I needed to not be saving the world anymore. I needed to be in a more typical state of consciousness, which took oh, another, okay. yeah, which took another like seven years. So how long were you in this state until you decided you needed to return? Uh, 10 years. 10 years. Okay. And By the way, shout seven, out to Catherine. Seven. Yeah. Yeah. Shout out to Catherine G. Lucas. Hi, Catherine. I hope you're watching. Hope you're listening. <laughs> yeah. And her book's very good on this subject too. You know. So you read her book and what was the return about? Um, okay. That, that I find interesting. Also, I find it interesting because I had, because I wasn't as, I had already started to ebb away and I wasn't in these intense states. I started to mm -hmm. get more of a distance from them. So I started writing about them. Okay, what the hell was going on all that time? And so the return, it was like coming down out of a, an expanded state of consciousness. But because I was curious and I had some distance from them, I still enter into those states of consciousness. So to me, it's sort mm -hmm. of a return into a typical um, way of being, a typical I guess, way of being. Um, mm -hmm. with access to these other states. Mm. Is it, does it have anything to do with Joseph Campbell's story? The, uh, hero with a thousand faces. Have you heard about that? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I read that and watched the Bill Moyers interviews. Um, I don't think so. I don't think so. No. I think it more has to do with, uh, with experiencing states beyond the reductionist paradigm accessing um ways of knowing that we're not familiar mm. with in the west but the other cultures mm -hmm. um would be a little more for. open to mm -hmm. yeah yeah all right and you know you mentioned other cultures having a place for these sort of things um i get the feeling we grew up in pretty much the same neighborhood even though we weren't in the same neighborhood 
Did you, did you grow up in London, Ontario? Or, oh, no, Mississauga, in, you yeah, in Mississauga, yeah. Mississauga. So, you know, you're on one side of, of Toronto in the suburbs, and I'm yeah. in Scarborough on the other side of Toronto in the suburbs. And that's about as meat and potatoes as you're going to get. I mean, there's yeah. no, back then, there's no dream catchers in Scarborough. You know what I mean? No, no, I no, mean, no. <laughs> no. No new age bookshops, no, none of this stuff. I mean, it's just, you get up, you go to work. If you're going to school, yeah. you're trying not to get beat up. I mean, that was <laughs> yeah. my experience, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And you know, not to interrupt you, but this, this, you're talking about like, what are the um, antecedents to my experience? That was one uh -huh. of them. Like you can't, <laughs> you can't expect a curious person to grow up in that environment and not wonder if there's more, is there more to this? And, <laughs> and this I've heard many, many, many people talk about and including Phil Borges on your interview with Phil Borges about mm. our disconnection. Like we become, I became disconnected in my little life in the suburbs. I didn't see my, I didn't see a relationship with the cosmos. I didn't feel connected to oneness i didn't feel connected to the people around me i didn't I lost connection with myself i didn't feel connected to nature so in that way these experiences were very very val valuable to me because they brought me right back into that mm -hmm. well and i guess for me to start and i think a lot of kids in the suburbs went through this were you were you of the generation that, that watched the Brady Bunch or are you a little yeah bit yeah past we're, that? we're the we're, no we're, we're the same generation I'm, I'm 56 yeah Brady 54. Brady, oh, but okay. the, I remember Leave it to Beaver. Like these are very sure. narrow ways of living. So strange. I was thinking about Leave it to Beaver yesterday. I think I had a dream about him. I, I was thinking, that's so weird you're bringing this up. Because I haven't thought about Leave it to Beaver for a very long time. You know, maybe, maybe we'll figure that out why. But, um, but the Brady Bunch, you know, I would watch that show and be thinking, why can't my life be like that? Why can't my dad be at home? You know, why, why can't I have gorgeous girls at my school? <laughs> like, uh, Marsha. <laughs> yeah. 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 You know? yeah. yeah. Um, and, and, and we, we thought it was real, you know, we thought the Brady Bunch was a real thing, you know, and it gets you, it just made us feel like our lives were lacking in some way. I think the television, yeah. But our, but our lives, in a sense, were lacking. I mean, it was boring out there, right? Yeah, I think um, the good, uh, I have had this discussion with a few people. Um, the, the, you know the poem, The Wasteland? I think that's T.S. Eliot. It talks uh, about, I've heard of it. I can't say that I've read yeah, it. Yeah, it sort of captures to me the experience of being in this like cultural void. Like we're not, we're not exposed to the things of the psyche. We don't recognize when the psyche becomes activated in these extreme states. And we see or start seeing like archetypal um, uh, themes played out like the, the life and death struggle. Yeah. We don't really recognize them for what they are because we're so we've lost, we're alienated from, from the psyche and the wasteland is we've lost our okay what about creativity like we're all born and we pretty we're pretty good at expressing ourselves when we're little but we we dampen that down and so to lots of people that i've talked about have had these experiences they see them as like necessitated processes they see them as crucial in bringing themselves back to life you know out of being uh, nurtured in this cultural wasteland mm -hmm. You know, where, you know, I, where I was growing up, it was like, you go to, you go to work, or worked at a supermarket and people at the supermarket, they'd ask what you're doing. And they said, well, I'm starting university next year. Oh, you're starting university. Oh, what are you going to take at university? Sociology. Oh, sociology. Yeah. What are you going to do with that? What kind of job are you going to be a sociologist? You know, I mean, there was a lot of assholes to be quite honest. I mean, just... You know, you just kind of keep your head down and just try and stay out of trouble for the most part. I mean, it yeah. was, I mean, materially we had everything and I'm very grateful for the schools I went to, 
uh, Catholic schools were, were a good place. And, and I'll give it credit to a certain degree because um, despite its obvious limitations, um, going to Catholic schools did sort of point us to another direction and say, look, there's more going on than what is going on every day in your life here. There's a, yeah, there's a bigger right. dimension happening, you know, now it was all about, so you need to be good or God is going to punish you, you know, that, that kind of thing. But at least there was that, that indication. Something you brought up a couple of seconds ago about um, the number of assholes. That mm -hmm. also is something that a lot of people, like I have belonged to this, uh, we both belong to the group She's of Awakening on um, Facebook. And a lot of people mm -hmm. were ex talking about this in the context of when they went through their, um, their spiritual emergency or their extreme states, they, when, and all the, the material that was unconscious, all the, the painful material that was buried in them when it all surfaced, they realized, wow, this is a very harsh society. Like there are, you can, you start to endure pain pretty quick off the bat from society. Like you go to kindergarten, you pee your pants, maybe once it's okay. You do it every week. You're going to get a reputation. These are five-year-olds. So yeah. people. Five-year-olds will tear you to pieces. Yeah. They right? will tear so that, you to pieces. Yeah. So that, when that comes up in these discussions, people start to, to see a desperate need for um, us to address the lack of empathy. And I, Katie Motram, who did uh, her great work with Emerging Crowd, she also did these books called Emerging Kind because she identified that people who go through these extreme and altered states that are very challenging to go through. And even, you know, if their diagnosis, like there, there's this psychosis or someone's having an eating disorder or uh, any very, very challenging experience, something about them, their experience really shows them the need for empathy in our society. And so she finds that a large portion of people who experience these very challenging um, times of their lives, they emerge kind, they emerge kinder. They want to help so it, the, so the others don't, uh, don't live with pain. I think if you work in your healing process, that that can be a likely outcome, like the wounded healer kind of person, you know, but it can swing the other way. I mean, Young said the torturer becomes, or the tortured becomes the torturer. You know, I mean, a lot of people with brutal childhoods grow up to have brutal, become brutal people themselves, but it's because they didn't get a chance to work on themselves or they showed no interest or they didn't care, you know? Yeah. 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 Um, have you seen, I'll just recommend this show to anybody who wants to know what it was like to grow up in the seventies. Um, Netflix, F is for family. You know, you take in a few seasons of that and, and you really get the picture, you know. Okay. Uh, and, I've heard that. And there good. was yeah. and there there was this great scene that what my favorite scene in this show. Um, this kid, he's getting beat up by the bullies at his school, and he's like eight, and the bullies are ten or twelve, something like this. And then his sister see what, sees what's going on, and she runs home and she says, Billy's being bullied down at the school. And his big brother just gets up from the dining room table runs down to the school, beats the hell out of these 12 year old kids. And then his brother who's been saved looks at him and goes, thanks. And he just boosh, punches his brother in the stomach. And then he goes home. Yeah, that yeah, was yeah. the seventies. You know, <laughs> it was just, just violent and, and funny and yeah, like rough. Uh, yeah. Oh dear. And I think the further back you go, the worse it gets. I mean, you know, my uncles were in the wars, you know, world war two and world war one. Most of them came back with drinking problems, you know, a lot yeah, of supposed to talk about these things. We were this, these are all taboo subjects. It's just why I love your show and the work you're doing because now we're, we're, we're able to communicate what it was like to go through these experiences and we're able to connect with people who are going through them and saying, Oh, I thought I was the only one. Yeah. Yeah. And forget, I mean, mental disorders. I mean, that, like I said, that wartime generation, you just didn't talk about the war. You didn't talk about it. Yeah. It was over and never discussed, you know, for World War One, World 
or two vets, never, never discussed. Yeah. And, you know, to put it again in context, another line from F is for family. There was a scene where the family saw this murder, basically the kids and everybody saw this, this guy b being destroyed by a, a, he ran through an airplane propeller, guts all over the place, something like this. And the father just goes, just push it down, son. Push it down. Just push those feelings right down, down. There you are. And, there you are. And, yeah, that was it. You know, you just brush yourself off and keep moving. You know, that was it. And maybe things have gone a bit too far in the snowflake direction where everybody's offended, but certainly talking about your feelings, opening up about what was going on with you, you know, is a, is a pretty important thing to do, obviously. Right. Yeah. Yeah. What do you think, um, came up for you that needed to heal? Well, I think a lot of it was like insecurities. So mm -hmm. I'm not pretty. I'm not smart. I'm not, I'm too uh, unlovable. Okay. There we are. That's what it all was. It was anything mm -hmm. where I'm unlovable. Yeah. That stuff, mm -hmm. all those memories. And I was, I remember I, uh, um, I came across something someone had said um, online somewhere. Psyche is a hoard, hoarder, like a hoarder. Like Psyche is keeps, a hoarder. Yeah, you mentioned yeah, that. Yeah, keeps everything. So I was like, I don't remember that incident from grade three, but there it was, like right up, coming right up. And so it was as if I was to re experience that pain, but to take its power, uh, not its power away, um, to take, I, this is a theory that people say that these are imprints. And when you re-experience mm -hmm. them in these certain states, the negative impact that they have on you is reduced. So yeah, it was a lot of like, uh, I'm unlovable because of this. And then like, psyche would like put like a really forgotten memory about, you know, someone calling me ugly in, in grade mm -hmm. school or high school. Did you, or... did you have that happen to you? Yeah. Someone in, in grade three, someone called you ugly? It, oh, all throughout. Great. Oh, come on. Grade school is a battlefield of its own. Okay. Yeah. 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 No. Oh yeah. Ugly. Like, uh, not getting invited to sleepovers, all this stuff. Right. Where you think as an mm. adult, you're like, what? I don't remember that. But so social rejection, social rejection, um, failing. Mm. Okay. Like not being able to do something where I really, really wanted to do it. So then like, oh my gosh, I'm a failure and carrying that all along right At, those are like the impressions of yourself when you're very young anyhow so everything along those lines that was all up there i'm curious about this childhood thing is is it okay to talk about sure yeah yeah, yeah? Oh, yeah. um you know usually when kids are you know young grade six or grade one or so they're about six years old they separate into groups and the boys go off and they become their group of six and the, the girls go off and become their group of six or whatever. Yeah. And then um, some girl groups, you know, they ostracize one or two of the girls, you exactly. know. Exactly. Exactly. That's These what happened are, to you? That's, I, I am very happy that you brought this up because I think mm. that this, this is a thing then, eh? Like, I, I mean, I knew, I've talked to a few people about that going on in their school. But I didn't really realize that it was like a full on thing. Yeah, yeah that mm -hmm. went on. We called, like, looking back on it, yeah, when we were in high school, we were like, we were like the Hitler use. Like, we would specifically target a person. And we would, yeah, we would yeah. rotate. We would rotate. So we would have, like, uh, you know, a, a, like you said, like six, uh, I think it was like 10 kids, yeah, 10 girls. And we would mm -hmm. rotate between who was to get ostracized, who was to get like two, like really, really, really damaging things. So if you think about that going on now with social media, you think, mm -hmm. okay, this is a serious situation when you have girls going <laughs> off to school behaving like that. Yeah. So that happened to me for sure. I also inflicted it on people for sure. Um, not as like the ringleader. But as a devout follower for a little while, uh, anyhow, so by grade six, I realized that this is um, not, not, not a good way to conduct yourself. Mm -hmm. 
when I was in high school, uh, all of a sudden, the prettiest girl in our high school started kind of hanging out with me quite a bit. And I was like, where is this coming from? Okay, I've been after her for years. All of a sudden, she's around and I'm like, what's the hidden agenda behind this whole thing? I'm not sure. And then she contacted me a few years ago on Facebook. And she told me that that year, all of the girls in our grade, all of them had coalesced to stop talking to her. There wasn't a single girl in our grade 12 class that would talk to this girl. And I think it was most, I mean, she could be a bit of a bitch, but she was, I think it was just jealousy, you know, for the most part. It's heartbreaking. She was gorgeous. It's heartbreaking that someone would go through that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's yeah. There you are. It's heartbreaking that someone would go through that. And it's, it's important to realize the impact of these things. Um, because like I said, like the people that I talk to who have gone through a spiritual emergency or a psycho spiritual crisis, uh, whatever they want to call it, a lot of them cite incidences like being ostracized in grade 12 by all the girls as inciting part of what incited their you know, breakdown. Yeah. Because I think, well, one, I think difference between, you know, boys and girls is I think the social life and being connected and involved is more, I think it's more important for girls than it is for guys. I mean, they want to, but when you're ostracized as a girl, I think it just digs a little bit deeper. You know, that's They're like, cruel. Cruel. that's like the being beaten cool. up. Yeah. That's like the being beaten up. And but being beaten uh, yeah. up, you don't you leave it all on the field. Whereas these girls no, will come out. No, you don't. Oh, <laughs> I kind of thought it was like, you just get it out. No, I mean, I beat up a kid when I was 14, um, he started the fight twice and he thought he was going to get the neighborhood b bully in, in, involved to beat me up. And the neighborhood bully came and said, I can't touch this kid. He's 14. I'm 16. I could go to jail. Like this is how serious the situation was. And, um, and I beat him up again because I was angry that he brought the bully around, but he picked it. He said he, th his exact word, I can still remember his words. He said, I could take this faggot, you know, if that's the way it was. And I have not forgotten that, you know, and I'm sure he hasn't either. There's a part of me that's still angry about it to think about it. Like when I, when I start to talk about it right here, angry about that, that happened, you know, and I never realized it was because I yeah, won, yeah. I won the fight, but I was still sort of traumatized by the whole experience. I had to hide for nine months because I had kids looking for me that I had kids looking for me that didn't even, that I didn't even know. You know, from another school, they were hunting yeah, me. Yeah, that is yeah. a horrible experience to have. And you're, yeah, Crazy, right? they, you're supposed to be like <laughs> developing or like growing ourselves and developing ourselves. Meanwhile, we're, we're being attacked by our fellow, you know, classmates. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Wow. We were going to talk about spiritual experiences, but this has taken a darker turn. <laughs> <laughs> I want to talk about the experience of I am Jesus. Oh, yeah. Well, let's get to that. Let's sort of bounce back from this horrific diversion. <laughs> so, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Okay. Well, I, the only reason I want to talk about it is because I feel like it's very, very common. Like I feel like oh, people enter, yeah, people enter into these um, identifying with, with Jesus or a savior under many circumstances like you can be in a, a, a state that a meditation retreat and your um, consciousness sort of shifts a little and next thing you know you're having these uh, kind of openings to higher higher ways of being and you feel like you're manifesting things all over the place and you're one with everything and you're and then you draw the conclusion like I'm I must be the second coming. But why I want to bring this up again is because I'm curious, because now that we are allowed to talk about these things, because places like your podcast and a, just a handful of others are giving us a place to share these things, that we can ex explore them more deeply and say, okay, well, what's going on? Like, what was going on that made you think that? Like, what were you in touch with? What were you opened up to? 
what was happening. Because if we really are in touch with something and there's a, a positive aspect that's real and we are bringing more light to the world or we are in touch with healing abilities or we are able to bring forth um, potentials that we didn't recognize were even possible before. Let's explore these. But right now what's happening is people are, they don't have the, they're not comfortable with sharing them. If they share them in the site system, they're being pathologized. So there's very, very little chance of exploration. Now I don't want to get into exploring them now. I just want to kind of bring that up as um, something that I hope to see more of in the future so we can well see. why not explore it now I honestly like I don't know like I want to see these explored I don't know because I was like seriously every time I brought up spiritual things in the psych hospital yeah I was so heavily um I, I'm gonna say pathologized but that's not really describing a, like, a situation of oh that's not you you're basically you're an idiot <laughs> and you're sick yeah, okay yeah, yeah? Uh -huh. so um that really became an obstacle to me fully exploring these things and so i i wanted well, how to did it how did it how did it play out in india so you're in india um, you, you thought you were jesus in india or no no i thought it was jesus by the time i got home but when I had merged, completely merged in with everything. So I was in India, I was um, sort of walking around in this bardo state, this dream dead crazy state going like something mm -hmm. is happening. Do I need to get home? And then little um, like situations like uh, I was in a somewhere and I saw a TV screen and it said, you're going crazy. You're losing your mind. I was like, huh, mm. TV? <laughs> like, so like that, those experiences of like kind of, where it seemed like the TV was talking to me and sharing what was going on intimately with me and more broadcasting it. Those kind of experiences were going on in India and continue for the 17 years. But um, I wasn't identifying as Jesus Christ. So now I've kind of brought up the fact about the TV talking to me. And go on about that. About the what? The TV talking to me. Oh, the TV talking to you. Okay, I want to get there. But... So when you thought, when you had these intuitions that you were like the new second coming, yeah. still, again, a very internal process for you. Like you weren't, you I weren't on the broadcast. street. broadcast, no. You but did not people broadcast. Do. Pe people yeah. do. <laughs> David, David Lukoff, he, he tells his story there publicly. You are. President of, or co-president of the Association of Transpersonal Psychology. And he went as far as he wrote an entire Bible. He thought he was going to save the world. I think he thought he was going to bring Jews and tr Christians together or something like that. Yeah. Or maybe yeah. unite world religions. He was giving his Bible out on the street. And, and then he started to get suicidal when people were not as enthused about what he had to share as, as yeah. he thought they and were. I don't, I don't actually even know if that's, if he, I'm not entirely sure he got suicidal because of that, but he might have. What I, remember hearing in a story other people say there's a um a height that you reach in these states where you're you're connected with everything everything's flowing everything's really synchronistic you seem to be manifesting things that you can experience bliss and then there's a descent and that i hear of a lot from people um so i'm not sure if that was david luckless experience or not but definitely a a period where everything is going like beyond your expectations and then to depression. And I don't know again, why that is, but I find that very interesting, but yeah, mm -hmm. so I didn't, um, didn't broadcast everybody that I felt like I was Jesus, but I, I, I started praying a lot. I saw that everything was filled with divine love. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that really did impact my behavior. You know, I was very loving towards everyone. Yeah, like uncharacteristically mm. so. And like to, to the point where they were worried about you? No, they probably just thought about time. 
Oh, really? They thought it was about time that you were expressing <laughs> yourself? So loving. I love you to everything and everyone. Yeah? yeah. I'm just kidding, though. Yeah, that. <laughs> I don't know if it stood out as like a market change, but um, that was definitely something that was going on. Like, I was just feeling that this sort of like Christ energy of unconditional love towards everything and everyone, mm -hmm. which again, mm -hmm. isn't uh, a sign of pathology. So in this intense state, I would, I remember I was, I was, uh, this was in the very, very early days back at my mom's in Mississauga. This is right after I came back from India. And I felt like I was just going to like disintegrate into the cosmos, becoming the cosmos and in charge of the cosmos. Mm. And someone on the TV, you know, looked right at the camera, right at me saying, stay here with us, which is what they say. Yeah. And I was mm -hmm. like, I'm trying to lady. I'm trying to, trying to stay in the, this <laughs> like rational world. I'm getting like sucked out. Um, and uh -huh. then, so that was one thing where I, you know, I thought the TV was talking to me. And there was other though instances of being in this very in intense place, which could still happen to me today, like where I'm so super connected and the, the um, barriers between myself and all that is, yeah, have broken down. And what I'm, what's, what I'm thinking in my mind, people are saying either on the TV, or I remember I was talking to my mom once in Mississauga, um, about something like I was saying these specific words, like, uh, maybe, um, Elmo likes big bird, but then Ernie is having frustrations with, uh, this is, I'm just making this up with, right. um, whatever, Fred. And then, yeah, a second bird. later, yeah, Bert, <laughs> Ernie and Bert, <laughs> yeah. a second later, the exact same words, not obviously not that example, but another example mm -hmm. for on the television. So these kinds of things happening were very uncanny. So the state that I was in wasn't perceptible, I guess, to the people around me, it wasn't showing on my behavior, but no one noticed. Like I had, I just hid these things because I didn't want to say like, holy crap, didn't you notice that I just said something and it was like right on the television, like uncanny things happening with people around me, but no one picked up on it. And if I was to discuss it, it was sort of like, oh, like something is seriously wrong with you. That still happens to me too. I mean, when my dad was in the hospital, because my dad died of um, sort of an Alzheimer's related kind of thing. It wasn't Alzheimer's, but it was something similar. We don't really know exactly what happened. And he's in his wheelchair in, in, in this room with 10 other patients. And he just... I'm talking to him and he just pops out 16, like 16. And I'm like, what's 16? And then the nurse comes in with my mother and says, we can move him to bed number 16 if you want. And I'm like, oh, okay. You know, <laughs> you know, obvious psychic activity going on, but people just sort of wall it out. You know, they just, oh, that's just a coincidence that, you know, but I yeah, mean, yeah, yeah, any, yeah, yeah. You don't need to be gullible to see a situation like that and go, that's not luck. That's yeah. that's something bigger happening. You know? I have something I want to say. First of all, I'm sorry to hear about your dad. And I'm sorry to hear that there was no like conclusive um, sort of information about what he was actually experiencing. But I, I also wanted to bring up this, um, what I feel very passionately about with these states, these states that we're both interested in and these openings that people express that they have. And I said before that I've heard from many people, they say it was as if I was seeing more. And there was this guy, he's in the States, his name, I think is Steven Morgan. He helped set up uh, Soteria. Sure, I know Steven. Yeah, okay, okay. Yeah. So he helped him. set up Soteria in Vermont. Yeah, okay, awesome. Mm -hmm. Okay, he um, spoke at this uh, Psychedelics Madness Awakening. Uh, conference thing on, on the internet a couple of years ago. Right. And I wrote down what he had said, um, cause he was talking about sensory gating and how much more of our reality is, is taking place, but we're not, we're not open to 
to perceiving it. Mm. We were sent since we're since we are maybe I'm, I'm going to say he wasn't us, and my theory is like around four or five. We learn what is real and what is not real, and mm -hmm. we start to gate. If these things are coming in, like psychic perceptions or clairvoyance or our memories of past lives, we start to gate that stuff so that we fit in. So what some theories are that I've heard is that in these states, we're activating communication centers that have been dormant or have been gated. And we are actually perceiving more. We are actually factually experiencing things that are taking place. But when these things are pathologized, it really is a kind of a stalemate on our, uh, our, our future exploration, at least in a certain population, of the accuracy of these experiences. Yeah, and I completely agree. And I, and I think a big part of the problem is that often people interpret these things when they go into non ordinary states, they can inter interpret them as concrete happenings. For example, if you have a vision or voice of an angel, that there's an actual angel there physically. And of course, from a scientific perspective, the angel is not there in our three-dimensional world. And so they dismiss the entire experience. But if you look at them symbolically and what's the meaning for the person, look yeah. at the subjective truth, recognize that, okay, objectively, materially, we none of us can have that shared experience, but that it means something for somebody, that it can be valuable and, and bring out that symbolic meaning for the individual. That's a big step forward. Definitely, know, that's a, that's a definitely. Forward. Just expanding our paradigm so that we allow for at least um, like psychic phenomena and uh, the non-locality of mind, I think is something that people were exploring. Non-locality of mind? Yeah, non-local yeah. mind. Yeah. Probably the same as Groff's holotropic mind or quantum mind. Mm. Right, right, right. Another thing that when I was, you know, searching at around the, the hospitalization point, when I was, um, I think around this point was when I was reading the uh, Red Book and your book and Catherine Lucas's book. And, uh, and I was looking at like Ken Wilber's stuff because I was looking for, okay, where are the frameworks for what I directly experienced? Where's something that's going to support these experiences that people are having? And where... Or how can we get together with um, other people who are interested? Like I belong to a group um, online of uh, psych people who are interested in psychedelics. I belong to a group called S Science Medical Network, and they're all very interested in exploring exploring these experiences. So there are places, but they're few and far between, and um, they are not at all. Um, sought after by psychiatrists on the whole, these sort of alternative explanations and frameworks. Mm -hmm. It is growing. I think it's growing, to be honest, by leaps and bounds, you know, I, especially the psychedelic realm. And um, in the new Netflix show, uh, based on the book, Michael Pollan's book, How to Change Your Mind, yeah. they do, they touch on the spiritual dimension a lot because when you have psychedelic experiences, you're going to have similar kind of experiences. It can be very healing. So that whole dynamic starts to open up, but they still keep the spiritual aspect at a bit of a distance. Um, because I, I think from a postmodern perspective, which I think Paulin brings of this sort of explorer, postmodern people are afraid to get dogmatic. They, yeah. they, they can, they okay. confuse uh, spiritual experience or conflate spiritual experience with religious dogma. Um, but it's shifting, you know, it's shifting. Okay, Jen. So it seems like we're at the end of our interview here. I just had one final question was, which was based on your 20 years, 20 odd years of experience with this. Do you have any advice you want to share with people who are going through something similar? Yeah. Yeah, I do. The first thing to do is find a community, find, uh, I belong to this group online called Shades of Awakening, um, or there's other communities that will 
support you through these things. Um, they will normalize them for you. They will be really reassuring. They're going to also often uh, offer like sounding boards that can help you um, discern between um, experience, between things that you might be have experiences might be having that you're not sure if they are healthy for you to be having or real and that you spend time in nature, that you give yourself lots of rest, uh, basically like major, major self-care, stop meditating, do not, do not do drugs. Drugs and these kinds of experiences, they're just going to accelerate it. I have a resource list of books, including Sean's, if you're interested, I can include <laughs> it in the little comment section on YouTube or on. on we'll put it on the thing. description. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah so description yeah. Box. Get resources, um, know you're not alone and uh, take really good care of yourself. And I, you know, you mentioned shades of awakening. Uh, I've been involved in a number of social networks over the years related to this subject. And always there were moderator difficulties, just one or two people coming in and just destroying the environment for everybody else. But for some reason, Shades of Awakening seems to have it right. Everybody seems very respectful there. I mean, of course, not everybody agrees all the time, but it just seems to have been a really nice environment for people who are looking to connect with others with a shared experience. For me, I think it's the best place for people to go that want to connect about their spiritual experiences, for sure. All right. Thanks for everything. It's been very interesting. Thank you. And um, see you next time. Yeah, sounds awesome. Thank you so right. much. It's been wonderful. Bye. Bye, everyone. See you later. <laughs>